Good afternoon, everyone. This is our second event for the spring semester. Today we have Yaron Brook, the chairman of the board for the Iran Institute. He is an internationally sought-after speaker and debater. He has co-authored many books, most recently, Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. He was a columnist at Forbes.com, and his articles have been featured at the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Investor's Business Daily, and many other publications. Brooke was born and raised in Israel. After moving to the U.S., Brooke acquired his MBA and PhD in finance from the University of Texas. For seven years, he was an award-winning finance professor at Santa Clara University. And in 1998, he co-founded BH Equity Research, a private equity and hedge fund manager, of which he is managing founder and director. Brooks serves on the boards of the Ayn Rand Institute, the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism, and the Center for Excellence in Higher Education. He is a member of the Association of Private Enterprise Education and the Mont Pelerin Society. Great, thanks. So, many people are just sitting up front. Huh? It's just a rule of, uh, of college life. Uh, so, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about finance, financiers. I think we build this as kind of the model case of finance. But feel free to just jump in with questions, whatever you get, and make this, given we're a small group, might as well customize it to what you guys are interested in and what's, uh, what's on, top, on your top of mind. Uh, I don't know, did he set up the camera? Is it rolling? Okay, we will we set up on the left, okay. Uh, so, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting phenomena, I'd say, in the world is the attitude we have towards, uh, towards finance, towards financiers. Since day one, uh, or since the last, certainly for the last 2,000 years, I can't think of a group that has been demonized more than anybody who has anything to do with money, money changing, money lending, banking, finance, Wall Street, so on. Every crisis is blamed on them. Every problem is blamed on them. Every villain in a movie or in a TV show is usually somebody involved in finance, or certainly a businessman. I think I saw statistics once. The 51% of all the murders committed on television are committed by business leaders, right? Uh, whereas in real life, it's 0.00001% or something, you know, trivial like that. But in television, we need villains, and businessmen and primarily financiers are attractive villains. And this is, this is not new. If you go back to uh, uh, Jesus kicking them out of the temple, right? The money changes are kicked out of the temple, they're the bad guys. If you go to Dante, Dante's Inferno, uh, the money lenders, Bankers, basically, are in the seventh rung of hell. They've got a bag of gold around their neck, and the gold is dragging them into the fire, right? It's, it's pulling them down into the fire. They are the bad guys. If, if you've ever read, one of my favorite Shakespeare plays is a play called The Merchant of Venice. Highly recommend it if you can ever see it on stage. There's, a, there's actually a movie with Al Pacino. He plays, he plays Shylock the money lender, the Jewish money lender, and there's a whole angle here about Jews as well in terms of finance. They're always linked historically. And of course, Shylock is the bad guy, and he's the guy who demands in repayment for a loan a pound of flesh, basically the life of the guy who can't pay him back. So instead of, uh, instead of in a sense, bankruptcy, what you get is a pound of flesh. Uh, and it's a fascinating play. Uh, both in terms of the anti-Semitic aspect of it, but also in terms of the attitude towards finance, the attitude towards money lending, and the way the court system runs in Venice of the uh, 1500s or 16th century. Um, you know, in modern times, I don't know, you've probably seen the movie Wall Street. I don't know about if your generation, if that's a big time movie, but uh, for, for us, that was the movie to see. And of course, in Wall Street, the real bad guy is the Wall Street guy, right? And, and if you listen to the movie, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating uh, uh, dialogue throughout the movie because the movie from the beginning, the guys who talk finance are talking in terms of warfare, in terms of blood, in terms of machine guns, 
in terms of everything is about violence. And there's this strong association, generally I think of capitalism and violence, but certainly of finance and violence. Uh, finance, and the reason is that we perceive finance to be a zero-sum game. War is a, what's war? Zero-sum game, positive-sum game, negative-sum game? What's war? Yeah, war's a negative-sum game, right? Negative-sum game in the sense that you're worse off after than before. You've lost, wealth has been destroyed, lives obviously have been destroyed. War's always a negative-sum game. It's always interesting to listen to economists like Paul Krugman claim that war creates economic activity. And it's somehow a good thing, uh, you know, uh, because uh, GDP goes up during war. Do you know why GDP goes up during war? Money. Yeah, they're printing money. So GDP measures uh, measures uh, government spending. So government spending is a positive on uh, on GDP. So government spending goes through the roof. So GDP goes up. So for example, first year of World War II. GDP in the United States grew, like the U.S. economy supposedly grew by 12%. But if you think about it, what did standard of living do? What did quality of life do? Like, it plummeted, right? If you were a man, you were off in the trenches somewhere in, in Europe or in the Pacific, your life sucked, right? And if, if you were a woman, you were now going to work, and, but you were working in factories to build what? To build machine guns and tanks, which were useless when it comes to actually improving human life. I mean, they're necessary, you have to defend yourself if you're at war, but they're not pro, really, economic growth. So even though GDP goes up, standard of living goes down, you always have to watch GDP numbers because they're always tricky in that way because they measure things that are not necessarily correlated with human well-being. So sometimes GDP goes up for the wrong reasons, like during the war. So war is a negative sum game. And, the, and the, the attempt is to associate finance, and always has been to associate finance, with a negative sum game. The idea is when you enter a financial transaction, everybody loses, or somebody wins, but it's at your expense. And overall, society is worse off. That is kind of how finance is presented in, in the movies, in stories, in our popular culture, in, in kind of the, the way we think about the world. And it's, and the two questions one has to ask about this. One, is it true? You know, maybe it's true, maybe finance really is a horrible profession, right? And second, if it's not true, then why do we have this perception of finance? Why do we think of finance, financiers, financial activity in such negative terms, in such zero sum or even negative sum terms? Because there's something important going on here, and it's not new. As I said, this idea has been going on forever. Uh, you know, money lending, money lenders are always the first guys to, you know, in, in, in olden times to get killed, uh, you know, and, and uh, they're certainly the ones to be demonized throughout. So first, is it true? Well, it's, it's amazing to me that anybody would consider that it's true, if you look at the world around us. Uh, every business, every business that starts, Every business that grows, and we know that businesses are what hire people, so every job that is created is at the end of the day created by, because somebody is willing to invest capital in order to make that business sustainable. Right? So think about what is it, let's take a bank, bank are the easiest kind of financial markets. What do banks do? What do banks do? What's that? Give they give loans. So what does that mean? Who do they primarily give loans to? Who is the primary who gets loans? Businesses. Most of the loans are given out to businesses. Some to consumers, but most loans are business loans. What do the businesses do with the money? Burn it? Waste it? What do they do with it? Invest. Yeah, they, they grow their plants and equipment. They might buy stuff. They might hire more people. They're using it to run the business, to actually grow the business. I mean, a bank's not gonna give you money, not gonna lend you money, if you're gonna use the money to, to go back bankrupt, because then you can't return it. It's usually because you're gonna invest that money in a way that makes a return from which you can return the money to the bank. So bank loans 
or one of the few ways in which the economy grows by growing businesses. By growing and businesses growing means employment is growing. And the banks loan money to all businesses. Anybody who walks into the bank, hey, I need a loan, I need to grow my business, do they all get it? No. No. What, what is the criteria by which a bank decides whether to give a loan or not to give a loan? Why would you give one guy a loan and another guy no? Credit worthiness? Yeah, credit worthiness. And what's the credit worthiness, particularly on the business side, based on? Your ability to actually do something with the money, right? Do something useful with the money. Actually produce, actually employ more people, actually grow the business. So on the on the loan giving side, not only are they giving loans to businesses, but they're giving loans to the businesses that based on their judgment are the best businesses. If you're a lousy business, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna basically waste the money, if you're not gonna be successfully investing in it, the bank is gonna try not to give you that money. Right? So the bank does two things. One, it provides financing, but second, and I would say much more important, it discriminates. It decides who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Who is going to actually be a good business person? Who's not going to be a good business person? Think about venture capital. Does everybody get venture capital in Silicon Valley? Do you have an idea? You just walk into, you know, Sequoia Capital or Klein and Pokins and they just write you a check, right? No, they're selective on the basis of the same thing a bank is. Right? Slightly different business, but same idea. They decide who, are, who is worthy, who has a good idea, who can actually generate probably profits, who's going to employ, who's going to build, who's going to grow a business, and who is not. So capital is not wasted, it's put efficiently deployed to productive activities. Which is hard. It's hard to decide what's going to be successful and what's not. Very few venture capitalists are good at what they do. Banking is a little easier, but even in banking, some of those loans, particularly if there's a recession, you know, don't get paid back. And you get rewarded, i.e. in profit as a bank, if you are good at it. And you get penalized and ultimately go bankrupt if you are bad at it. So there's a self-reinforcing system which makes sure that the best people at allocating capital, at deciding who deserves capital, who's good at deploying capital, who's not, they rise to the top. They're the ones who are successful. Now that's one thing, one thing Bank says, yeah. So you would regard <coughs> bailouts of certain financial businesses as interfering with the mechanism that's determining who is succeeding in business? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, bailouts of a way for the government to say you don't have to be responsible anymore. You don't have to think too hard about how you're going to get the money back or who's a good investment or who's a bad investment. Indeed, you can take on massive amounts of risk, which is often associated with high, at least short-term returns, because on the upside you get to benefit and on the downside we bail you up. So don't worry. Don't do your job. Don't think about what you actually need to do because we'll bail you out no matter what. So I think bailouts are unbelievably destructive to the ability of a bank or ability of any financial institution to do their job properly and to get penalized when they do their job badly. And therefore, if one bank, right, if one bank is doing badly, you know, if one bank is doing badly during a financial crisis or whatever, and therefore, is, is about to go bankrupt. And another bank hasn't done badly, has actually did a good job during this period, and is doing okay. When you bail out the bad bank, you're doing two things. One, you're rewarding vice, you're rewarding, or at least, you're rewarding incompetence. Right? And, you're, and you're saying incompetence is okay, and you're penalizing the good bank. Why are you penalizing the good bank? What would happen if the, if the bad bank goes bankrupt? The good bank would take their customers. They would grow. Right? But now they've got competition, which is funded by government funds, 
which is funded by a bailout, not funded by a market, not funded because this other bank is really a competitor. So you're penalizing the ability of the good bank to expand, to grow, to, to, to and therefore you're actually expanding incompetence in the economy. And, and what they did, what they did in uh, 2008 during the, the bailout of the banks is just horrific in terms of its consequences for financial institutions in the United States, in terms of uh, you know, how we see banking and what, how banks can function. Because the good guys got penalized and the bad guys got rewarded. And when you create that kind of incentive structure, you're just asking for more trouble. You're asking for more crises. You're asking for bad investments and bad allocation of capital, which is, I think, why we got such slow economic growth post-crisis, one of the reasons, and why I think the next crisis is very likely to be worse than the previous crisis, because we're building up this bad, you know, these bad investments, these bad uh, incentive structures. But yeah, bailouts a distortion to a, a healthy market process of correcting for bad behavior and rewarding good behavior. Rewarding, I know banks that came into the financial crisis during the financial crisis, never had a losing quarter, made money every single quarter. They had no financial problems. And if they were forced to take top, the, the bailout money, they were forced to pay it back to the government with, with an interest, so the government made money off of it. And they couldn't expand their business because the banks they would have liked to have, you know, actually taken business from were bailed out. They also got the same kind of top money. The government treated good banks and bad banks exactly the same. We treat good kids and bad kids exactly the same. There's going to be problems as they grow up. There's going to be problems. So having a healthy financial market on the on that side, on the side of deciding who gets the money and who doesn't, is crucial. Because it is what spurs economic growth, it's what rewards good companies, encourages them to grow, it's what holds back bad companies and encourages them to shrink. Think about, think about when we transitioned a long, long time ago from, from buggies, horse buggies, right, to automobiles. At some point there, there were some great buggy companies. I mean, really, really good buggy companies that made world-class, phenomenal buggies. And there were a lot of people employed in making buggies. But it was a dying industry, in spite of how good they were. It was dead. And my guess is that before the people who worked in that industry, before the CEOs of those companies knew that they were dying, the bankers, the stock market, the investors figured it out first. And what was probably going on is buggy company stock went like this, went way down. And at the same time, automobile company stocks were going up. And, and by doing that, capital was exiting the buggy world and entering the automobile world. Now that, seeing those kind of things is hard. There are lots of changes in industry every single day that are happening. And central planners, government bureaucrats, are notoriously bad at being able to figure out what's a dying industry. And, and often they don't have the balls or the guts to actually shut down a dying industry, right? Because there's political consequences. There are going to be people unemployed. So a, a bureaucrat is likely to prop up a dying industry, to subsidize a dying industry, to keep it alive and not allow it to die. But it needs to die because that capital needs to be allocated to the automobile industry so that industry can grow and at the end there are many more jobs in the automobile industry than there were in the buggy industry. So you're net way better off by letting the industry die than not. And that's something markets do very well every single day. They're killing companies and rewarding companies. But it's something government is very, very bad at doing because the incentives they don't have the right incentives. Their incentives is who will vote for me. And angry people don't vote for you. So you have no incentive to create anger. Yeah. Give us a current example. Move away from the automotive buggy example. 
I mean, you have examples going on all the time. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an 80s example, then I'll move to today, right? So in the 80s, there was, in 80, we used to have a lot of manufacturing. People talk a lot about manufacturing. We, we lost manufacturing jobs. There used to be a lot of manufacturing in the Midwest. And during the 1980s, we shut down a lot of that manufacturing capacity because we weren't very good at it. We weren't very efficient. Uh, we don't have a competitive advantage. In those days, those jobs were moving to Japan. Uh, that manufacturing was moving to Japan. Ultimately, they moved to China. Maybe, who knows where they're moving today. Maybe Vietnam, maybe even parts of Africa. Uh, that those manufacturing jobs are going to move. Uh, where did that capital go? Where did that capital go? Because when you, when you shut down stuff, you sell it, you free up capital, you've got now money and equipment and stuff that you can use for something else. What do you use it for? What did they use it for in the 80s? Silicon Valley. I mean, Silicon Valley took off in the 80s. Where did they get the capital? Where did the money come from? Right? Money, it wasn't printed. It wasn't the government doing it. So it came from all those, you know, so-called, all those uh, shutdown plants, all those, um, uh, all the unemployed people for a while, right, unemployment continued to drop, but for a while there was unemployment. All of that, that capital was taken and put into Silicon Valley to create far greater value, far greater economic growth, and far more jobs long term, and to create the future. And all of that was done by the financial markets, because no CEO of a particular company thinks, oh, I should shut down my plan and take the capital and move it over there. Because they, they're not moving, right? They're here. And all they can see is their employees, their plan, their factory, and that's all they can think about it. They're struggling to survive because they can't compete. There's a wonderful movie I recommend, if you want to see a movie. It's with Danny DeVito and Gregory Peck, which is just an amazing pairing up. And it's called Other People's Money. Other People's Money. And it's all about exactly that. You've got New England Wire and Cable, which Gregory Peck runs. And he wants to allow it to survive no matter what. And Danny DeVito is a corporate finance guy who wants to buy it up and break it up and shut it down and move the capital elsewhere. And that conflict, they each give a speech towards the end of the movie, which reflects exactly their kind of view of the world. It's brilliant. I mean, the, 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 the script is brilliant. Uh, and it's, it's really well made. Uh, and Danny DeVito is a good guy, and Gregory Peck, in my view, is the, is the bad guy. But you would never think that. That's part of, you know, I think they do that on purpose. You can't actually have a good looking, good guy financier. So if you're going to have a good guy financier, they have to look like Danny DeVito. Right? That's the kind of, uh, it's based on a play. And on the play, the guy has a limp, right? You can't even, so no matter how you structure it, the financier has to have something that, that you can't admire about. Otherwise, you know, you can't, it doesn't work in a, in, a, in a work of art. Did you raise your hand? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, if you want to, a, a, a modern, modern example right now, it, it's going to happen. You're going to see it as we move forward. You know, you know, the United States, just a fact that nobody talks about. You know, in the United States, in terms of manufacturing, what do you think? We manufacture more stuff today or less stuff today than we did, let's say, 79 when we had peak manufacturing employment? Do we manufacture more stuff or less stuff today in the United States? More. I mean, you just said peak manufacturing. Well, peak manufacturing jobs. Jobs. No, peak I mean, manufacturing I think with automation, there's a higher capacity. Yeah, so we manufacture a lot more today than we did any time in our history. So in spite of what Donald Trump tells you, in spite of what anybody says, the manufacturing sector in the United States today is the biggest it's ever been in American history. It just, we didn't lose jobs to the Chinese. What happened to the jobs? Robots. What's that? Robots like took the jobs. Yeah, robots took the jobs. Computers took the jobs. It's all automated today. But we make more stuff than we ever have in our history. I mean, actual stuff. So what you're going to see, and what you're constantly seeing, is movement towards more robots. So if anything, we will be producing more stuff with fewer people every single decade into the future. The, 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 the future of work is not in manual labor. The future of work, particularly not any kind of manual labor that can be automated. Maybe there's some manual labor that can't be automated, or it's very difficult to automate, 
that will sustain itself. But automated kind of manual labor is going away. So seeing as we're moving away from repetitive uh, actions and manual yep. labor, we're moving towards more cognitive fields for labor. Is there a risk that there's going to be a social stratification based upon people's intelligence? Or, like, look at the, the Silicon Valley. Most of those people have a higher than average IQ. Yep. Yeah. If we continue to move towards a society that has uh, the jobs based off of cognitive ability, is there a risk that increasingly there will be people at the bottom of the IQ lottery who gain who won't have the ability to gain employment or that's I mean no one has the same ability as yes. anyone else. Yes, no, absolutely. So so we we've got a we've got a bell curve of IQs, you know, and, and uh, what happens to people at the lower end of the IQ curve in terms of their ability to be employed. Uh, but there's no question, you've already seen this, that the return on cognitive ability is only going up. Right? And I wouldn't say cognitive ability is just an issue of IQ. I know a lot of high IQ people who are lazy, or a lot of high IQ people who are just jerks, or a lot of high IQ people who are just who don't use their IQ, who are just stupid, you know, really stupid smart people. I know a lot of people like that, right? So it, it's not that you have the IQ and therefore you're determined to do well in life. Character matters. And character is something you're not born with. Character is something you determine for yourself. You actually create. So people with good character and high IQ are going to do very well. If they work hard and they're productive, they're going to do very well, and they're going to, that, they, the returns on that are going to continue to, to accelerate. The question is what happens to people with low IQ, and I think there are always going to be jobs for people with low IQ. It's just they're going to be different ones, right? Uh, there's certain things that, at least, it's hard to imagine robots doing in the next 20 years potentially 30 years and maybe 100 years, I, you know, it's hard to tell. Uh, some jobs, it's relatively easy, some jobs are hard. Uh, you know, if you're working in McDonald's behind the cashier, your job is, is over, right? It's, it's going to disappear. Uh, it's, it's disappearing already uh, because it's so easy to put an iPad there and let people order off an iPad, particularly if minimum wage is 15 bucks an hour, which is where it's going throughout the United States at 15 bucks an hour, it's cheaper for me to put an iPad there and have people order for themselves, right? Have one person who's like moving around in the back to make sure there are no problems and no issues, or if somebody has a question. Um, if you're in, um, if you're working in, 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 in California, if you drive, um, every, every strip, you know, strip mall has a nail salon, like pedicures and manicures, right? 20 years ago, it was very unusual to see a, 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 a nail shop, right? This is a new phenomenon. These are thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs that have been created that didn't exist 20 years ago, right? So can a robot do that? No, not yet. And it, a big chunk of the pedicure manicure business is the conversation. Robots can't do that, right? It's the social thing, right? So are they jobs safe for now? Yeah. And, and we only seem to be using stuff like that more. So if you think about luxury stuff, uh, getting a massage, you know, there's like massage envy now everywhere and places like that. It never used to be. We couldn't afford it. It just means we're richer now. We have more leisure time now. And therefore, these are, these are jobs that were created. Nobody could have imagined, I think, if you'd asked somebody 40 years ago, there's going to be a nail salon in every strip mall. People would have said, you're nuts. Who, who gets manicures and pedicures? Like, they're very rich. Nobody else does that. Today, everybody does. Same thing with massages, same thing with a lot of different things that I can't imagine, and you probably can't imagine, about 40 years from now, where the jobs of people with relatively low education or low IQ or however we want to measure it, those kind of jobs they will do. I, I was sitting once in, uh, at a, a high rise in Chicago, and I'm looking out the window, I'm like, on the, I don't know, I'm on the 50th floor, and there's a building across from me that's even taller than that, and the guys, like dangled in this little piece of wood cleaning the windows of this thing. And I'm going, you probably couldn't pay me a million bucks to get on that thing and clean those windows. Right? It's just not, I couldn't do it. I feel heights, there's no way. I don't care how high my IQ is, that I am not doing. Right? And now you can imagine robots doing that, but they're probably expensive robots. 
it's not easy to do that. It's, you know, the, the, the idea of putting the right pressure on the window and, you know, you can do it. It's all doable, but it's expensive. Ask the robots, they're using robots to clean solar panels and solar panel farms. Oh my God, that is so expensive, so difficult, consumes so much energy that it's, it's part of why solar energy is, is an illusion. It's, it, you know, it's, it's so expensive because you have to clean them, right? particularly if they're in the desert and cleaning them is unbelievably costly. So there's always going to be jobs like that that it's just cheaper to hire a human being than it is to hire a robot. But it's also true that unless we get our educational system in order, unless we get our educational system right, we're screwing up a big chunk of our population who put aside IQ, who just won't have even high IQ kids, just won't have the skill set to be able to have jobs in a in a robot-driven, technology-driven economy. And it's why if there's one issue that is probably the most important issue that we face globally as a society, it's education and the fact that education sucks. And education sucks primarily for those who can't afford it to suck for them because they have no alternatives. So the poorer you are, the worse the education you're getting today in America in spite of the fact that it's government education and the pouring money into it. And it's not an issue of dollars. It's an issue of the whole mentality of how we do education. Right? So that is going to be a key in, in, in places and countries that get education right are going are gonna to transition much more health, in a much more healthy way to a robust economy with, with automation than, than uh, countries that don't. With Uber and the taxi industry would be another example of the creative destruction that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, Uber is a good example, right? So money is flowing out of the taxi industry. Medallion prices in New York have plummeted. They used to be over a million dollars. Now they're under 250000 They've gone down by 80%. That's like a stock price going down, right? It's the equivalent. And at the same time, Uber is going to go public here later this year at some ridiculous absurd valuation, even though they've never made money. But you see the capital is flow. Nobody's investing in taxes. Nobody's buying taxi medallions. Nobody wants to be in that business, and, and, and all the capital is flowing into the alternative, which is Uber, Lyft. You know, I think they're both, uh, both uh, and if Airbnb grows, you'll see capital flowing out of the hotel industry and into, you know, I, I think you're already seeing whole entities who organize condo buildings to be Airbnbs, in a sense, be hotels that are unregulated, you know, so which is what Uber is, taxis that aren't regulated. Because today you can get taxi apps that are almost as good as the Uber app, but the difference between a taxi and Uber is the level of regulations. Taxis are heavily regulated, Uber's not. And the solution, of course, to that, if you want real competition, is to eliminate the regulation on taxis, but that would never happen, right? Because that's not how bureaucrats, not how politicians think. They, they, don't, they, don't, they, they almost never reduce regulations on a, an, in an important scale. Yeah. So, just to relate that back to the good actors versus bad actors. Sure. Um, the regulations that do apply uh, to Uber, they regularly violate them, whether they be you know, city uh, traffic pollution laws or the mild background checks or a, a myriad other things yeah. um, where Uber just has the financing to pay the fine and continue with that practice. Uh, so where does where do you draw the line between uh, a good actor in stimulating the economy and providing a service and a bad actor in overstepping the lines in the name of providing that service? Well, my view is that at the end of the day, customers are going to make that decision, right? So if, you're, if, if, the, if it's true that Uber does light background checks, for example, then you know, some of us are going to get worried about using Uber, particularly at night or, or for a loan, and we're going to just reduce our demand, and the market will take care of it. Um, you know, I think the regulations are stupid to begin with. So I would, I, you know, the, the fact that Uber has to apply to any regulations, I think is ridiculous. It, the fact is that I rate my driver uh, as a customer. I think that's, that's the genius of Uber in the real competitive advantage. Is I can see before he arrives, and of course if he has a rating, I think under four, they kick, out, they kick them out of Uber anyway. So I can see what rating, I can cancel the trip if I don't like it. Uh, or if I don't like the rating, he gets him angry. And some passengers are super jerks, and or you know they're drunk, and you know and, they, and, and drivers don't want to take them, so they don't take them. 
So the fact that there's a rating system, the fact that you're evaluating them on an ongoing basis, to me, is far better regulation than what the government is, is trying to regulate them. In, indeed, what I'd like to see is the elimination of all these regulations on both taxis and Uber, and let the market really see competition and let it flourish. And if I run stringent background checks and I have a competitive Uber and I advertise that my background checks, you're always going to get a decent human being driving you, then let's see how much consumers value that. Let the market determine these things. Rather than a bureaucrat deciding what's important and what's not important to me. And I don't think they know what's important to me. I know what's important. That's generally the problem of central planning. The main problem of central planning is Somebody else trying to decide what's good or not good for you, what's right or what's not good for you, what values you should pursue as a human being. The only person who knows what's good for me is me. And I, I might get it wrong a lot of the time, but that's my problem, particularly if I get to suffer the consequences of mistakes, which is why I get bailouts again. It's you got to let people suffer the consequences of mistakes, otherwise they don't learn, the markets don't learn, and, and you just tend to repeat mistakes instead of actually learning from them. Do you think there should be any sort of regulation on the contract contract economy, like people like Uber and all these other places, though? Or do you think, because otherwise, it's always going to be cost effective to shift people into that model of like no benefits, no uh, any sort of anything else that are kind of attracting to become uh, characteristics of employment in America, as we know. Yeah, but are those trappings good trappings? I I would argue. That one of the biggest problems in America today is that we we have replaced actual dollar compensation for people with benefits, and and I think the benefits are distortive. I think the benefits make it very difficult to, for employees to figure out how much they're really getting paid and what they really what their real value is. It's hard to compare between two companies offer you two different packages because the benefits are so distorted. And also, what the ben what what health insurance has done. Because we get health insurance through our employer, that has completely distorted the health insurance market and is one of the most destructive things that have happened. And of course, it happened by accident. Right? I don't know if you know the history of why we get health insurance for our employers. It's, it's, a, it's a direct consequence of government intervention and the response of the market to government intervention. So what happened during World War II is that government froze all salaries. So all salaries were frozen. You couldn't give anybody a raise. But you wanted to give people a raise, right? Because they were being more productive and some people were maybe being more productive than other people. And you generally wanted to have a mechanism by which to reward people. So what companies started doing is they started giving benefits to their workers that were not wages. And the government, that wasn't frozen, so they could get around the wage freeze by giving you health insurance now, paying you health insurance premium, and the government let them get away with it. And then after World War II, a lot of companies were doing this, so the government said, okay, well, you can, you, can, you can deduct that from your taxes. So anything you give the workers benefit is an expense that we're recognizing you don't have to pay taxes for it. And now, the companies that didn't do that had to do that in order to compete, because if I, as, a, as an individual, go out and buy health insurance, it's on after-tax dollars. But if I get it through my employer, it's on pre-tax dollars. So there's massive benefits to getting from the employer. So the whole way in which our healthcare system has evolved over the last 60, 70 years is because of, a, of price fixing during World War II, which was a mistake. They shouldn't have done it, and, but they did it, and we suffered the consequences, and a huge consequence, because the whole insurance market is completely distorted by this. Instead of you owning, you know, one of the problems with pre-existing conditions is, I don't own my policy. My employer owns the policy. So if I ever lose my job, I lose my insurance. Why? It's my insurance. Why don't I own the policy? If I own the policy, it doesn't matter whether I lose my job or not. It's my policy. I'm paying directly to the insurance company. So if you own your policy, the whole issue of, 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 of a big part of the issue of pre-existing conditions goes away because now the policy follows you. So there are all these distortions in the marketplace that are, that, that are created uh, because of these benefit packages, and I'd like to see the benefit packages go away. They're all mandated. They're not driven by markets. They're mandated by either government mandates or by distortions created by, by government. So I'd like to see people paid actually salary, and then you figure out what benefits you want, what benefits are right for you, 
and purchase them in the marketplace. So if it's health insurance, you want life insurance, you want unemployment insurance, you want whatever you want, you go out and buy a package that is appropriate for you. Again, but part of this is I view human beings very differently than, a, than the central planning mentality views human beings, right? The, 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 the typical view of human beings that drives the whole drive towards central planning is we're too stupid to take care of ourselves. So if I didn't provide you with these benefits, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go and get them themselves. But there's plenty of history to suggest that's not true. You know, before there was a welfare state, we organized in all kinds of mutual associations, we got together in all kinds of ways in order to provide insurance for ourselves. Uh, there used to be a mutual aid societies. And you could buy, in the marketplace, you could buy poverty insurance. So you could buy an insurance policy that covered you if you ever became poor as defined by the insurance policy. So if you lost your job or something like that, it would kick in. There were all kind of amazing market solutions to problems that people face that once you have a welfare state, they price them out, right? All of that innovation, all of those products disappear because people now rely on the state for everything that they get. I kind of lost my question, but uh, so what you're saying is that government should take hands-off approach and allow the free market to determine the natural life cycles of industries and companies. And we should, as a society, should accept the short-term consequences for the long-term gains of new industries and greater growth in society. And, and the consumer will be the one that determines whether these new services will work like through yeah. things like the Uber bike car rates. But the consumers or the end users only see the last step in the stage, how do you stop companies from taking shortcuts upstream to prevent a detriment to society? So what kind of shortcuts? Give me an example of a shortcut that's, that's detrimental to society, whatever the hell that is. Something that will be a cost-saving measure that, let's say, I don't know, instead of, I'm, I'm manufacturing something, instead of uh, dumping my waste to a, a safe waste yard, I just dump it in the river and I pack well, I mean, my solution to that, this is often called the problems of the commons, right? How, how do you protect the commons from abuse and, and from people, people using them badly? I mean, my solution to, to really all problems of the commons is not to have any. Privatize. No commons. No commons, right? So if, if the lake is private, you're not going to dump your waste in my lake. If the streams are private, you're not going to dump your waste in my stream because I'm going to sue the hell out of you if you do. So I suddenly have an incentive to monitor what's going on. If there's a, if there's a piece of land outside there and people are just dumping the garbage in it, it's probably owned by the state and nobody really cares. But if private ownership, if private people own that land, they wouldn't let people just dump their garbage in, right? Because what, who do, what do we take care of the, the best? Our own stuff. Like, if, when, you, when the Berlin Wall came down and people went into Eastern Europe and saw what was going on there, the thing that shocked people the most, more than the poverty, more than the awful products they were making, more than anything, the thing that shocked them the most was how filthy everything was, how dirty it was. And there's a reason why communism, socialism breeds filth. It's because nothing is privately owned. And if stuff is not privately owned, we don't take care of it. Uh, uh, you know, the whole, the way capitalism works is through self-interest. It's through taking care of your own stuff, taking care of yourself. That's how capitalism works. You go to work because you're trying to make a living. You don't go to work to uh, benefit mankind. You don't go to work for some social agenda unless you're working for a nonprofit or something. But even then, you need to get paid, right? So you go to work to make a living. Hopefully you love what you do. Hopefully you're going to work because you love it, you enjoy it, you're having fun doing it, right? And then maybe, as a third goal, you're going to work because you want to change the world, you want to make the world a better place or whatever, right? But Steve Jobs, none of these entrepreneurs wake up every day saying, I want to make the world a better place, right? I want to go and do fun stuff, that's what they wake up. And then secondly, I'm going to make a profit doing it, and thirdly, the only way to make a profit, you can ask me about this, is to make the world a better place. Because... If, if, if customers don't think they're better off using my product, they're not going to buy it. The only way people are going to buy my product is they believe they're going to be better off as a consequence. So, capitalism is a system about the pursuit of self-interest. 
It's a system that is geared and motivated and driven by self-interest. And the way that is self-correcting is to make sure that everything is in somebody's self-interest, everything good. And so how do you make it in somebody's self-interest not, you know, not to have this piece of land dirty? You don't make it private. It's easy. And it used to be that way. I mean, the East Coast, almost everything is privatized. I mean, not the rivers and lakes, unfortunately. And the West, 75% of all the land is, is owned by the government. But it used to be in the West that the rivers used to be owned privately. So there's a whole, I mean, you can, you can look this up. I mean, you're all law students, right? There was a whole, it, during the late 19th century, a whole body of law, common law, that dealt with what happens if I, my cows poop up here and you're drinking the water down here. And how do we, how do we you know, deal with those kinds of situations? Privately. Not government regulations control, but just privately. Now imagine that was really applied across all the rivers and all the lakes in the United States. And imagine if that body of law didn't stop developing sometime in the early part of the 20th century, because basically all the rivers were nationalized, all the lakes were nationalized, and now it was all a political issue, it wasn't a, a, a legal issue. But imagine if that legal common law had developed to really figure out how do we deal with private property when it comes to waterways, when it comes to, to these things that, that, that people use. I mean, I think we'd be in a much better situation today than we are where it's all political. And when it's political, how do we make decisions? How, how's, I mean, the difference between private property disputes through the common law and how that decision making goes versus how do you make decisions when it's political? Fear. Well, fear, but who's making decisions? It's democratic, right? But what drives democracy? Well, the will of whatever the majority who's voting, because <laughs> Often, most people don't vote, right? In most local elections, most small elections, judge elections, things like that, a minority of people vote. And then, who is, who is, who is going to influence politicians the most? The people with the most at stake, the people with the loudest, the people who have the biggest, you know, you know maybe the, the biggest wallet, maybe it's just the biggest voice, maybe it's the people who can rally the most voters. But it becomes, democracy becomes, pressure group politics. It doesn't become, let's figure out what the best solution is. You know, when is the last time politicians sat around the table and said, let's figure out the best solution to this problem? I can't think of a time in, in modern American history where that has happened. Usually it's this pressure group wants us to do this, this pressure group wants us to do that, that pressure group wants us to do the same. How do we balance all the pressure groups and how do we minimize the damage to ourselves? That's how politics functions. And that, that's why I think the, you know, the U.S. is in the position it's in. We, we've divided ourselves into little tribes based on the political pressure group. We believe that it's going to give us the most leverage so we can influence policy the most. Not for the good, but just for the most, for our little group. And, and, and politics is a complete disaster today. There's no sitting down and thinking about how to solve problems. No, in my view, there isn't. I mean, uh, people talk about term limits, people talk about all kinds of mechanisms to do it, but I don't think you can change the incentives of politicians. The incentives of politicians are basically bad. Uh, and, if, and if you read the founders, if you read the Federalist Papers, they knew that this was going to happen. They, they, they would try to establish kind of a system of checks and balances to prevent it, but today the whole system is distorted. Our, our Supreme Court doesn't really take the Constitution seriously and won't monitor and then, then they're accused of being either activists or non-activists, which is a false dichotomy. Of course they should be activists. Activists in the name of getting rid of stuff that's not constitutional. But what does the Constitution even mean? Our interpretation today of the Constitution is very different than it was 80 years ago. Um, I don't see a mechanism short of limiting the power of government significantly. And the only way to do that today well, today I don't think you can do it. But the only way to do it, if you could, would be to, to rewrite the Constitution in clearer terms to make it clear what powers politicians have and what powers politicians don't have. So I'm one of those arrogant individuals who would like to completely rewrite the American Constitution because I think it was great, it was the best they could do probably at the time, 
Of course, it's full with contradictions and, and compromises, horrific compromises that, that you know, hound this country to this day. But the fundamental, the structure, the way they were doing it, there were good intentions there, and they did probably maybe, uh, you know, as good a job as they could, particularly with the, with the world of politicians. But today we know so much more. We know what can be distorted. We know what compromises they made, which were evil and bad. We know how to fix them. And I don't think you can fix them just by amendment. I think you have to fix them by rewriting. So you have to, you know, Congress, for example, for decades now, has shifted authority to the executive branch in mass, right? And that, that's not what the Constitution says, right? The, the, every, any trade deal, anything related to trade, has to go through Congress. That's what, that's what right? But they've shifted this one. They've given the power to the executive branch. We haven't declared a war. We're fighting like in, I don't know how many countries now. We've got troops in every, I think 120 countries in the world have American troops, right? But we haven't declared a war since World War II. We fought in Korea and Vietnam, in Iraq. We did a thing in Grenada. We fought in Haiti. I don't know, all these places. And we've never declared war. Why? Because Congress doesn't want that responsibility. So it shifted it to the executive branch, which has made the executive branch more and more and more powerful. Right? And now they can write emergent. Now, you know, Trump has just done this emergency thing on the border. Right? Whether you agree with it or not, that's not his job. I mean, there's a law from 76 basically saying we Congress don't want to have to deal with these issues. They're too hard for us. And we have too many, you know, too burdensome. So we're going to give it to the executive branch. Okay, so now you've given this immense power to the executive branch. You get upset when he does, when he over exceeds what you would like him to do. So, we need to reset everything. We need to reset what the executive branch is for. All the regulatory agencies. There was no consideration in the Constitution for a fourth branch of government, which is the regulatory agencies. Or the Federal Reserve. What's the Federal Reserve? It's a pseudo-private, completely controlled by the government entity that serves the Treasury, but is accountable to no one really kind of accountable because the chairman has to go in front of Congress once a year, but you know, there's almost no way to get rid of the chairman of the Federal Reserve. So uh, the world has changed dramatically since we wrote this document, and to really change things, you would have to rewrite it. Unfortunately, because I wouldn't trust anybody in the world right now to rewrite the Constitution, because they make it a thousand times worse. So I'll take what we have. But if you're asking what would it take, it will take shrinking the power of politicians dramatically. I would like to see them out of the economy, I'd like to see them out of education, I'd like to see them out of science, I'd like to see them out of the realm of ideas. I mean, and make that, I think a lot of that's implicit in the Constitution, but you need to make it explicit in the Constitution. Otherwise, it goes over. I don't think they're gimmicks, and I know people are always looking for gimmicks to fix things. Things are going to get a lot worse in American politics before they get better because, because there's no mechanism by which to make them get better. Oh. So, what are your thoughts on the antitrust regulations? Should they exist in any shape or form? I can't think of any worse regulations than the antitrust regulations, right? So, again, I'm going to make a broad statement about antitrust regulations. You guys are lawyers, so you can quibble with me afterwards. But antitrust regulations basically are there to give the government the power to basically have power over business, almost no matter what a business does. So if you're, if you're underpricing your competition, if you're selling a product really, really cheap as compared to your competition, can antitrust be used against you? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You're dumping or you're, uh, you know, I forget the legal term, but, but you know, you're, you're doing something bad. It was the basis for the antitrust case against Microsoft. What was Microsoft doing? Anybody know why Microsoft was sued for antitrust violations? Selling cheap computers. No. It was giving away a product for free. Oh, the word. It wasn't word, because what they were charging, it was Internet Explorer. At the time, I was old enough, I remember, we had to buy your browser. I paid 70 bucks for Netscape, right? You bought a browser and then you could browse the internet, right? And Netscape, that was their business model, to sell you a browser. And Microsoft came out and said, we'll bundle it, we'll, we'll just give it to you for free if you buy our operating system, which everybody was buying, right? Say everybody got a free browser and Netscape got upset 
And so if you're, if you're really cheap, they're going to go after it, right? If you're selling really expensive stuff, can they go after it? Much higher than your competition. Yeah, I mean, that's a sign of monopoly power. Otherwise, how do you get away with it? Markets drive your prices down. So if you can sustain a high price and a high profit margin, there must be a sign of monopoly power. Therefore, they can go after you. So they can go after you for pricing above your competition. And if you price exactly the same as your competition, can antitrust go after you? Yeah, because it's collusion. So you can't win. I mean, it's, and it's built that way on purpose because the purpose of antitrust law is to give government absolute power over business decisions. I mean, you see it in, in the way the antitrust departments go. They, they've never gone after Google. Never gone after Google. Why have they never gone after Google? They have 90 something percent of all internet advertising. Why don't they go after Google? The Europeans have gone after Google. The US antitrust division has never gone after them. Why? Because Google has, from day one, because Google, Google came into existence post Microsoft antitrust case. So Google, from day one, has given money to politicians across the board, both political parties. Everybody gets money from Google. Just look at their files. They, they give money to everybody. And they give a lot of money to it. Microsoft, Microsoft famously never used to give any money. They, their lobbying budget, until the antitrust case, their lobbying budget was exactly zero. They were literally bought in front of the Senate. Armin Hatch, who still, I guess he just retired from the Senate, was a Republican from Utah, stood up and yelled at the Microsoft executives. You guys need to be here in Washington. You guys need to have a lobby firm here in Washington. You guys need to spend money here in Washington. You need to build a building here in Washington. And Microsoft walked out of the meeting, this is all documented, said, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. And six months later, antitrust division comes knocking. It's all about power. Um, you know, Uber's been very good at spending the money around, at buying off the right politicians in the right place, places to get what they want done. Other companies, Apple has not been very good. So Apple got, they went after Apple for a little while at least. Now Tim Cook has dinner with, with Trump every few weeks, right? Because he knows. He knows. Bezos doesn't have dinner with Trump. So guess who they're going after? They, you know, they're, they're just eager to go after Bezos. It's all politics. There's no economics. There's no law. There's no law. Because the bureaucrat gets to decide who to go after and who not to go after. Mergers. There's all these mergers happen, right? Why do some get through and some not get through? I don't know. There's no legal, there's no legal doctrine. You think there's a, you think there's legal, of course they write it up as if there's a legal reason, right? But there's no re legal reason, it's all about politics, it's all about money, it's all about who's bribing them. I mean, it's not a direct bribe like they do in some third world countries. It's an indirect bribe, it's a more sophisticated bribe, but it's a bribe. And this is what happens when you give politicians power. And this is an antitrust. This is a great example of that. There was a, there was a thing recently where they, they disallowed a merger of, yeah, I can't remember. You know, the, the, the government wanted to disallow uh, a, the at and merger. The government wanted, why did the government want to disallow? Well, the rumor was because it was a way for Trump to go after CNN because CNN was part of this deal and, 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 and he was anti-CNN. And, you know, for all I know, the rumor is absolutely right because there was no other reason because deals like that, of that exact nature, this was a, wasn't a uh, horizontal deal, it was a vertical, have always gone through. The, the Justice Department has never stopped deals like that. And yet this one, they try to stop. So, yeah, I'm very opposed to antitrust. It gives, it gives government this huge leverage over businesses. And, uh, and, and the way politics works, it's always going to be abused. I, you know, I don't believe, and in, in, you know, this is the economist in me, we have to wrap up, but if you look at history, if you actually look at history, in a free market there are no monopolies. So people who are supposed to behave like monopolists never actually behave like monopolists. Whether it's Standard Oil in the 1870s when they had 92 to 94 percent of the overfunding capacity in the U.S. and your economics 101 teacher will say prices went up and quality went down, and the exact opposite happened. Prices went down every single year. Quality went up every single year. Because what Rockefeller understood and what every good businessman understands is there's always competition. Unless, unless the government is borrowing it. That's real monopolies. You can't compete with the post office. There's certain industries in the United States that are very difficult to compete with because the government has created barriers. And I would argue that until Uber, 
Taxis were a monopoly, right? The government created only so, so many medallions. Why? I mean, obviously, you know, I, I was hailing taxis in New York when there was no Uber. You could never get a taxi, particularly when you needed one, particularly in Russia. Because the way the medallions worked, the way the flow of taxis worked, there was no, there was no what do you call it, uh, rush hour pricing or whatever. There was no incentive for more taxis to work during rush hour. They couldn't charge more. One of the beauties of Uber, one of the things they're criticized for, is this variable pricing. But the variable pricing is what makes it possible for me to get an Uber anytime, any place. It's more expensive, but I can choose not to pay it, or I can choose to take a taxi, I can choose to walk, or I can choose to change my schedule and not seek an Uber during rush hour. But now I have a choice, which before I didn't, and it was a government-protected monopoly. So anything Uber does, including circumvent the law, is fine with me, because the laws are stupid. I mean, I have the same attitude towards things like illegal immigration and stuff like that. You create stupid laws, then don't be surprised when people circumvent them, right? Of course, people are going to come to this country illegally because it's impossible to come here legally, or almost impossible to come here legally. You want to fix illegal immigration? Fix legal immigration. Make the laws such that people can actually come here who, and, and decide who, who you want kind of thing, right? But, but have rational legal immigration laws. Today's laws are completely nuts. They make no sense for anybody. And that's why you get masses of people coming in. These people want to work. So create a work requirement. You know, set up that anybody who wants to come in has to have a job beforehand or something. And these people would come in, they'd pick apples in Oregon, the Mexicans, and they'd go back. So what? And nothing would happen. Nobody would be worse off. Everybody would be better off. They'd be better off because they've got some work. Now they come, they can't go back. Because the same barriers that are there to bring them in, they, they can't go back. So they come and they stay. And that creates all kinds of, and they only have work sometimes. They don't, that creates the problems. The problem is the legal structure. And that's again politics. It has, and nobody has sat down, this is another example, nobody sat down and said, okay, how do we devise the best legal immigration system that makes sense in America? No, it's about pressure groups. It's about the immigrants shouting this, and it's about business shouting that, and it's about you know the, the people at the border shouting something else, and about the some xenophobic Americans shouting, shouting something else. And it, it, there's no let's figure out what's true. No, let's let's pander to the worst elements in our constituency, which is what you're seeing the immigration debate evolving. So as you can say, I'm cynical about politics and very positive about markets. Thanks, guys.